Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I do all kinds of electronics, tool reviews, and here lately I've been on a kick with LEDs and microcontrollers. We've got the scrolling marquee made with the WS2812B, Knight Rider lights, things like that. Well, one thing I've been wanting to do for the longest time is kind of mimic the old Ambilight feature from Philips TVs. Now, Philips, I believe, owns the trademark on the word Ambilight. So, I'm just going to call it Ambient Light. They also, I believe, hold the patent on the idea of integrating the LEDs into the television itself. That precludes any other manufacturers like Vizio or Sony or anybody else from making such a product. There are lots of DIY projects out there all over YouTube, and I've watched every single one of them. Well, quite a few of them anyway. But none of them really did exactly what I wanted. So, my goals were, number one, immediate response response time. I don't want the LEDs to lag behind the picture on the screen. I want them perfectly in sync. I also want fine detail. In other words, I want the WS2812s where the LEDs are very close together. I wanted it color accurate. That's the real trick because these LED strips are not that color accurate. And of course, they're not necessarily going to match the settings on your television. And whatever mode you're going to watch TV in most of the time is the mode you want to be in when you're doing these tests. You don't want to be in game or PC mode where you've got zero latency. You want it in cinema mode or whatever your preferred mode is. I like cinema mode. I've got a Sony OLED 65 inch and that mode works fantastic for pretty much everything. And it does introduce a little bit of a lag on the television happens to coincide nicely with the slight delay of the LEDs. Okay, so something I had forgotten to mention is the wall behind the TV is kind of important. Now in my house, this is a rental house and the walls are kind of a darkish tan. Unfortunately, that really affects the colors reflected on the wall. So what I've done is taken a piece of styrofoam insulation, a four by eight sheet, much like what I'm using here that I painted green as a green screen only this is just white and I've stuck it behind the TV here. That helps give it, you know, a uniform color. And speaking of color, one thing I've noticed in every application I've ever seen of an ambient light type setup is the oversaturation of color. And it tends to draw your eye away from the television and off to the sides. I don't like that. The screen is still your primary focus. The ambient light should be just that ambient. That's just my personal preference and that's why my little app, as you can see here, has a saturation adjustment. If I crank it all the way to full saturation and do the spinning color wheel thing, I mean it looks cool, sure, but if you're trying to watch a movie here, it just gets a little a little too much, too intense. So I turn the saturation down and all that does is mix the red, green, and blue together a little bit. About between 50 and 70% seems to work best for me, for my personal preferences. How did I mount the LEDs on the TV? Now most people just go simple and install starting with the first LED in the upper left corner. Then they go around here, down, over, back up. Well, I had to get a little more confusing than that. From the TV's point of view, I'm going this way, 10 LEDs, then 44 up, 81 across, 44 down, 10 more this way, and then 61 on that little bump out in the back. But the starting point is at LED number, oh heck, it's tricky. It's all in the code. Link down there somewhere. Did I want them right on the edge of the TV? No. I didn't want to be able to see the LEDs from the side of the TV. I didn't want them to be pinpoints. I figured about an inch and a half in. I know that sounds like a pretty wide gap there from the edge of the TV to the LEDs, but that's what I went with. I just used some blue painter's tape and I put it on all four corners and in a few other spots and used that as a guide to help line up the LED strips. I'm power feeding both ends and I'm only by the way using a 3 amp 5 volt power supply and I've got fast LED set to limit to 2800 milliamps to give a little bit of headroom and that seems to be working great. I mean do you really need more than 15 watts of light coming from behind your television? That's like a 60 watt bulb. I don't think you need that much. Works great for me. When you're watching a movie something goes off to the right of the screen, it goes off to the left and it's going all over the place and just it is just 
magical. Now, how to drive the LEDs? Obviously, you want to drive them with something like an Arduino or an ESP chip. All right, I'm going to butt in here, future me. One thing I forgot to mention was a very important detail that's called the sacrificial LED. Most people will choose to use a level shifter that takes the 3.3 volts coming out of your microcontroller to bring it up to the 5 volts to control your LED strip. I've had nothing but problems with those. For one, the cheap ones you buy are meant for I squared C, which is a much slower data rate than these require. Those don't work. You have to buy a fast TTL logic converter. I don't want to have to build a whole circuit board around this. I literally need this and two wires coming off of here. A data and a ground. That's it. I don't need logic level shifters and all that. I have found in every single project I've built that the sacrificial LED works every single time. All you do is you take some black tape and you take LED number one, go ahead and peel back, not just the uh, protective backing here, but the actual adhesive as well. And you take your black tape and you just wrap it around that first LED. So if it starts flickering or being weird, you'll never see it. And it buffers the logic. In fact, each LED chip buffers the data to the next and to the next and to the next. So you don't have to worry about data loss going down the line, just that very first one. Then if you decide to change microcontrollers, you don't have to worry about logic levels. In the code, you'll see I simply assign an array and then use plus one. All that does is skip the first LED. So fast LED never bothers messing with this one. I used an ESP01. I only need one GPIO to drive that whole strip. That worked but it relied on Wi-Fi to talk to the computer that processes the image data. And depending on what else is going on on your Wi-Fi, it was a little hit or miss. So using Wi-Fi was out and I decided I wanted to go serial and that's when I discovered the limitations of the knockoff Arduinos. This is the Elegoo brand version of the Arduino Nano. Functionally identical in every way, with one exception that never mattered until today. The serial port chip. The Elegoo version uses the Chinese CH340 and it maxes out at 115.2. 115,200 baud. You can roughly translate that to bits per second, but that cheap Chinese chip is a limitation. So I went with W-R-O-O-M. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that. Room 32. It's an ESP32 clone and this is the dev kit V1. What's nice about it is it has a super fast serial interface. I found it to be reliable up to I believe it's 9261. I, I think I put an extra zero on my notes there, but it's almost 10 times the speed of the 115.2 and reliably so. So this connects directly to a PC. Just a basic stock Windows 10 PC. It's a dual core, just something I had lying around running my security cameras. And I figured, well, if I plug my HDMI through a cam link into that PC, then I can use some kind of software on the PC to then send data to this, which will then send data to the LED strips. F fun stuff, right? Well, what software to use? There are a lot of choices. My rules were it had to be open source. I wanted something I could modify if I needed to. And I don't want to pay for something like this when there's plenty of very talented and people out there making open source software. So what runs on here, by the way, is just a very, very simple sketch. It's using the Adalite protocol, ADA. With that in mind, what software did I end up using? I tried Prismatic, didn't like the interface. It's capped at 115.2. I didn't feel like modifying the sources. So I tried Hyperion, then Hyperion NG. Both of those were very crash prone in my experience. Every time I changed the setting, the thing would crash. And the only way to turn off the serial output on Hyperion NG in my experience anyway was you had to shut the program down in order to upload code to your Arduino or sorry ESP in this case. And I stumbled across Hyperion HDR which I believe is a fork of the original Hyperion project. Now I'm not using the HDR stuff but the interface is way better and most importantly it does what I want it to do. When something brightly colored goes off the edge of the screen, it lights the wall up that color. So the code in here includes the ESP async web server, and that runs a small little HTML, CSS, JavaScript thing that I threw together, just as a little interface for your phone. So I can turn off the top and bottom LEDs, make it sides only. I can also turn off just in between the stands on my TV because it's not wall mounted, not until I get a a new house. I find when there's black bars, when you're enclosed like this, you really don't want going off 
because you've got a big gap of black and now your wall's lighting up. So that's why I can turn that off real quickly. So with all that said, that's basically it. It takes a lot of tweaking. It takes a lot of trial and error, but uh, it can be done and it can be done with an inexpensive throwaway PC. Now, of course, Hyperion runs on the Raspberry Pi, but I happen to have a living room computer that sits and does basically nothing. It's my former desktop. Getting hot in here for some reason. I Oh my God, I think I'm... I think it's time to get out of here right now. So, uh, yeah, I'm burning up. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you like these kind of videos. If you like this particular one, hit that like button below. And I'll see you next time. And uh, in the meantime, here are a couple of other videos. I literally just dragged my phone off of the table it was sitting on while it records my audio. <laughs> I hope it's still recording. Yes, it is. All right.